Think of the amazing creation that we have available to us every day, the wealth that is here for us, no matter how thoughtless we have been towards it, no matter how much we have allowed thoughtlessness to draw us away from not physically the land, although in many ways in that respect, but psychologically. Much as a wife and husband could draw apart when they cease to communicate with one another. We need what this land has to offer. And we need those things for a reason. Because they're part of the beauty and fullness of life. And we don't need quite as much as we actually take from it the way that we live. If we lived a different way, we would need a lot less. Here's a simple example. You go and get some lettuce from a store that was grown in California uh, a week or two weeks ago. It has virtually no nutrients in it. You pick that same lettuce and eat it within an hour or two, and a bunch of that lettuce can fill you up more than all the lettuce you would buy in a store. And that's, that's just an experience that people all over the world have every day. Because vegetables don't decay right away. They start feeding on themselves in order to maintain their vivacity. For us, presumably. And after a week or two, they've eaten pretty much all of their own nutrients. So it's actually bad for you at that point. And that's, that's, a, that's a, a result of our thoughtlessness. But, think of the information that comes to us, and I have friends that have their own gardens, that encourages us to be more thoughtful. And yet, you know, and how much live or more live food is available to us if we only take advantage of it. Everything we need is usually close by. Most people live near farms of some kind, within, at least within driving distance. Not that I recommend driving, but you want to move closer to these places. You want to be around people who are at least connected to the land so that at least by some few degrees of separation, you can enjoy more of the land that speaks to every cell of your body on a supremely individual basis. I don't know how many times I've moved, I rent a lot, to different places that grow with herbs that are specifically useful to my needs, where the, the local nature is particularly a blessing to whatever I have need. This land is no different. This is an entire meadow, or bramble, maybe is another way to put it, of what are called nutka roses. These are wild roses, you can eat them. I'll leave it to your imagination what rose petals are good for. In the course of eating these roses, I've reconnected with some lovely women in my life, uh, my mother being one of them. I am reminded of the blessing that women have brought to my life, irrespective of the difficulties that any one man or woman can be to us for various reasons. And that's a nice place to, to be or to enjoy from time to time. I would rather be in that state than, than any other. Imagine the intelligence of that bee. That intelligence of that bee, though it's a small creature, it doesn't have the size of our brain, but it's operating with the brain of all creation. It has the power of the brain of all creation. And that's the power available to us in ways that aren't even available to that bee. Right? How often do you read a textbook saying something like that? That's a rabbit. Right? It's not that hard to read what a rabbit has to teach us, fertility. 
They make great homes in the earth. Warrens, I believe they're called. You know, I used to make films in high school. I was quite the filmmaker. Did quite well at it. I'd write huge storyboards, wonderful films, funny films, dramatic films that didn't mean to be funny, but were still funny. And uh, I used a camera that probably weighed about 10 pounds. I never thought that I'd be holding a camera that weighed 6 ounces and also had a phone in it. But, uh, and I could access something called the World Wide Web full of tons of allegedly information in what I would call the least informed age of human existence. But the information is there for those that want to find it. And, and of the information that's there, a lot of that is poor information too. So you keep searching. But this camera can't possibly record what I see. No camera could with my own two eyes. And so I record that with poetry. images and record that with the choices that I make in my life and what I can gather together of something of the fabric of the kind of life that God meant for us stitch by stitch as it were I asked someone I was talking to yesterday I went on about climate change a little bit and how people's minds will completely rationalize facts that contradict with what they've been told. You know, the man who, when told that we have 95% water vapor as an alleged greenhouse gas, because I don't think even the whole greenhouse effect is even proper science, but strictly speaking, even according to the heliocentric model, the Earth is precisely the temper it should be compared to Venus, simply based on being farther away from the sun, allegedly. The science just doesn't add up. And, you know, if you, when you lie, things aren't just always going to add up. We just aren't taught to look at a lot of the things that don't add up. But when told that the atmosphere was 95% water vapor, he just sort of said, well, that's not really a gas, and then kind of shut up really quickly. That's the effect of a cult. And I don't mean to demonize anyone, it's the effect it would have on any of us. I grew up in multiple cults, and I'm still deprogramming who knows how many cults. I mean, he only learned, earned, learned the earth was flat, what, two months ago? I mean, these videos are largely about me deprogramming and trying to help this, the heliocentric cult, help bring together and summon, as only the sickness of the world can, something of the thoughtfulness that God gave me. To speak to my capacity to know better. And there's no one else to blame for that. It's a wonderful thing to be responsible to the law of your own joy and knowledge and quality of life and logic and reason, memory and destiny on this planetary ship, this plane, this mothership woven together with stars and leaves and seeds and rabbits and bees and people. I spoke to a friend's mother today. She was letting me know about the mental illness, history of mental illness in their family. They have a son who has paranoid schizophrenia, or so it's called. I mean, mental illness is a bit of a suspect science to begin with, but clearly shows signs of being a little more disrupted than a son need be. And um, she mentioned that her father had mental illness. And, and uh, there's just a lot of sickness in the world. And whatever it is, it's all a mental health issue, let's face it. I mean, I think Jesus and other beings were really treating the world for mental illness. We don't call it that, right? We say things like, oh, we're spiritually lost or other sort of interesting platitudes, but we're mentally ill. I mean, let's call it what it is, right? All the other creatures except men enjoy all that p the living peace of nature has to offer them. Right? We have peace in the world. We just don't enjoy all the peace that there is to offer us. And we can. Today feels like the beginning of winter and it's actually the beginning of summer. It's just 
the, the seasons are a form of art. They're notes that overlap, and the same notes that compose winter become subtones of early summer. There's a song here, a song that speaks the language of the notes and codes, and I do mean codes and formulas of our own soul and life itself. And to get the knowledge, the benefit, the power of that technology, you can't take nature apart thoughtlessly. Approaching nature in a thoughtless manner, however indispensable it may have become to us, or we may accept it to be in order to protect ourselves from the pain that thoughtlessness creates, according to the cybernetic algorithm, as though we never had or since irrevocably lost all sufficient born coordination with nature to assuage all of the kind of suffering we see around us, as though it is endemic or genetic, and not a product of our thoughtlessness. That is a psychosis that we apply to every theory and political system we aspire to, right up till today, including the flat earth, which at a structural level means that they will never be helpful to us, as long as we employ thoughtlessness in their articulation and exegesis. I can't be any clearer about that. I spent my life observing and studying mental illness. It's not about what people mean to do, it's what they need to do. And people's needs say a lot. Some of those needs are for happiness, and some of those needs are to protect us from the law of our own joy, which we're taught to fear. And that's a reversal of whatever religion started off with. You need the law of your own joy to become enlightened. You need enlightenment to live enlightenment. You need peace to live peace, to live according to peace. You can't just cobble together some way to live with all of your mind and all of your analysis and all of your technology that's going to somehow summon something like peace. That's impossible. And that just adds more and more stress to the mind. However much extolled that form of discipline or technology may be, or augmentation of thought with various concepts like that just make real no, no logical sense from the, the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden to black holes and big bangs. It's thoughtlessness that degraded our communication with nature. A nature that we'll ought, we can make mistakes in, will provide alerts to the brain God gave us, and, but we ourselves have to choose to ignore those alerts, and they will increase and become more extensive. And our brain function goes down and they'll become more extensive. And then only the problems themselves, the illness we create around us and play host to and protect within us is the only thing that ultimately can speak through all the suffering in the world to our capacity to change, to make a new choice, to be thoughtful every way that we can. The world will do what it needs to do for the next several hundred years. But there is peace here. Every stem, every leaf, every bee is alive with it. We're in a library of peace. You can read about it every day of our lives. It's here. The fullness of life is in us. The poem is complete. And it is yet to be completed. It's a, not a question of having peace. It's a question of nourishing our, our natural capacity for all the peace, all that peace has to offer us as man and the order of man, the natural order of man. Knowledge, thought, quality of life, virtue, happiness, peace, thoughtfulness, morality, responsibility, honesty, romance, imagination, health, natural moral proportions, born coordination, body and soul with the whole of cosmic life, native cellular intelligence, the primacy of communication through every commutative sphere of the organs and faculties of body and family and nation and earth and sky. The preeminence of the codes and notes and scriptures of the human soul. 
and the body. It wears and disrobes from day to day and life to life. Fullness within fullness. An unchanging fullness changing everything in terms of ourselves, in terms of our own dreams and feelings and purest thoughts of what we too may conceive in terms of all that God gave us. The, the only life that can save us, the life that God gave us. This is not something... This is something that is preeminent to the scriptures of the sky and the scriptures of the books. And if the scriptures of the books match your inner scripture, then that's great. But if we can't, if we're not encouraged, and this living school encourages though people to make those determinations in terms of their own inner scripture, then all those books become useless. You've disrespected all the holy books. It doesn't matter how good they are. It doesn't matter how good your political system, if you disrespect the codes that God gave you, your own capacity to make your own determinations, then you're, you're turning everything into a weapon. The greatest tool of peace will become a barbarous club. And we've missed that because we've turned everything upside down. We live in this cult of the imposition of do this, think this, write this, read this, say this, know this, learn this, and then you'll get the happiness. But no, you need the happiness to get all those things, to be able to perform all those functions without accruing undue stress upon the mind, however pleasurable it may seem. People taking on extra work or taking on new self-discipline or new philosophies or ascending to the nth plane or moving into the photon beam, these all will seem pleasurable. Fantasies can seem very pleasurable. A fantasy book, because fantasies are how we deal with the assault of reality that we've consigned ourselves to. And it feels good. It feels good to forget our pain. It feels good to just find another channel to live on. But that doesn't make it reasonable. What, what kinds of results are we getting from that? from living the fantastical science fiction scriptures that are mapped onto everything we call the utility of our technology and our navigation systems. Right? Philologically, ontologically, epistemologically, physically, chemically, astronomically. We're not getting the results that we should, right? Look at the, the epidemic of mental health crime in the world. Treat the world as a body, one body deprived of the nutrition of its native codes and formulas and their natural commutative cellular correspondence with this living world that you're looking at right now. Living air, living light, living food, living truth, living beauty, living light, living thought. In every animal of the world. deprived of that, that body will have any number of illnesses. Because that just the complex concentric systems of the of the body. You put sand into a car and all different things are gonna go wrong. And if you think that's the only way to drive the car, and you start to find better and better sand, or better and better ways to cut down your apple tree, not that cutting down trees is bad necessarily but thoughtlessness is always bad. You're cutting down a tree to save your life. If you do it thoughtlessly, that is a disrespect to this creation and to your own mind. Because it's a relationship. If it's worth being happy, and your happiness knows that it is worth being happy, and with happiness and with our inner genius, we will approach nature in a naturally, easily thoughtful manner. No one has to force us to. How many people would have to force you to act in a nice way if someone give you a billion dollars today? They wouldn't force you. You would naturally be happy for a day or two. You would just be in tune with everything. I had an out-of-body experience once, and I felt so blissful for the next two days. I literally floated through the world. Nothing was a problem for me. I got along with everyone because I'd had an experience of bliss. Right? So, we have no trouble behaving in a most enjoyable uh, way in conceiving of thoughts of great strength and precision. That's not a problem human beings have. 
but we've taken too much of an interest in installing, extolling a way of life though to protect us from destruction, that destroys our capacity to enjoy the peace and the happiness that we are heir to. And of course it's self-perpetuating, right? It creates forbidden fruit, it creates... It creates forbidden fruit that turns into the God that can save you from being banished from your land or something i don't know i mean how this how people rationalize this to themselves then you you kill a god and it makes you better buildings are fall to the ground and somehow you can finesse some kind of technology that's going to save you out of that irrespective of the technology of all the life around you i look at people's minds i i take the measure of them you know whatever their ideas are however however altruistic they may seem if they can't reason according to this living land they'll turn everything into a club eventually and the priests of this world know that they don't mind handing out truth they don't mind handing out truth about anything they don't care if you know about a flat earth or the fake moon landing or the the, the hoaxing level of the holocaust or anything about 9-11 whether it be um, there's certainly something like a nuclear weapon being used. But again, I would call that a theory. I wouldn't say that there's evidence of that. There's evidence of things that lend themselves to all kinds of theories. And I'm open to that. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if, if whatever you get out of it, you're bound to use like a club. When I went to school, I was told history is important because you need to know where you come from. It also provides a map for just about every dimension of human existence. And history really comes through our families. So you'll notice that no matter what history you learn in school, your family actually determines a lot about how you are in this world. Because the family are the cells of how information and traditions or illness are transferred through the world. What recourse we have to feeling safe, articulating and enjoying the born correspondence of the memories and filaments and images and formulas and codes that come down to us betrayed through like like the sun through the clouds through our mother and father at birth and how we see them through the lens of our born bliss that's how memory that's how history that's how knowledge is transferred and in a state of happiness we can learn everything we need to learn but or, or summon the knowledge that we were given by birth but in a state of great stress, it becomes harder and harder and harder. Think of how much time you spend at school and how little you actually learn. How little you're able to actually gain the benefit of this immense creation around us. How few people actually even think that it's worth learning about these beautiful flower petals growing on here. Right? I would offer you one. That's actually not a Nootka Rose. <laughs> it's a slightly different flower. I actually don't know what this one is. But I could tell just by putting it in my mouth right away. Different texture. So that's the intelligence of my body. Right? A child knows the difference between different textures. Because I don't want it is, I'm not going to swallow it. At most flower petals are actually fine. But immediately I knew it was different. Who knows what medicine this flower has? Maybe it'll kill me, who knows? I put something in my mouth once, I was with a friend, and he, he said, spit that out, spit that out. I said, oh, it's a bit bitter, it does taste funny, and he, just, he thought I was going to die. And I was like, no, no, my body's intelligence will let me know. Just because it's bitter doesn't mean it's bad for me. Just because, just like bitter events in life doesn't mean that it's bad for us. I've learned, I said to my friend, I've learned so much from the bitter truth. And maybe that's, maybe that's a bit of my philosophy. Maybe I, I don't mind talking about the negative things because I think the bitter truth is really good for us. You know? It, it's, it's, it's really good for us. I don't know what else to say. It just is. It touches my heart. It touches my soul. Yeah. I, I thank people I have uh, when I approach the comments on these videos I'm always a little apprehensive 
because I, I know how people can be. And, uh, but I, I had a really nice comment today, and I meant to, um, I meant to just say thank you to that person who said that they've been watching these for weeks, and it actually helps them feel that peace might actually break out in the world. <laughs> thank you so much. I, I thank you not just, you know, because that's flattering to me. That that's not really the main reason I would thank you. It's because it's just so wonderful that anyone would feel that for any reason. Because I feel the same way. There's every reason for for us to enjoy a lot easier life. We've made it so difficult, and it's only our pride that stops us from seeing how easy our lives could be made less of a strain. You know, a lot of spiritual books feel really good, but they actually place more strain on our lives. A lot of foods say that they're healthy and the supplement stores are making, you know, money hand over fist. And a lot of these natural foods are actually owned by industrial farming and uh, pharmaceutical corporations. And they actually just are more stressful. Like, I don't eat food that has more than, like, five ingredients in it. You can get these Vega things with, like, literally, like, 50 things in them and maybe, like, one microgram of spirulina. I eat, like, a spoonful of spirulina every day and chlorella. And that's it. There's just one thing in it. You look at the label, spirulina. You look at the label, chlorella. And it has literally hundreds, and if not thousands, of micronutrients in it. I'm not saying you can live on it. I'm not saying it's good for everyone. But I'm saying that in a, with a body in a world with so little nutrition, it's proven to me that it could be good for a lot of people. And you can't live on it. I mean, I'd have to eat gobs of gobs more of it every day to live on it. I'm not saying you can. I'm not saying that every nutrient is represented as much as you might happen to need, but it's in proportions that come closer to the kind of codes that God wove into nature and then gave us such easy access to. I don't need a degree in nutrition. Right? The food around you on your land, and I hate to bug people because most of us don't have our own land, but I like to think about this. If I had my own land and my food and I was walking on the land with my feet and it could feel my bacteria, which reproduce every 15 minutes and have up-to-date information about information regarding to both our body and the climate and all the kinds of information. If those seeds had touched my saliva and they knew uh, not only my current health but all perspective issues according to every climactic and psychological force on the earth, on the flat plane of the earth, and that food was growing around me and I came and I caressed that food during the full moon and I was on that land every day and that nature that loves me we just have that added little bit of communication from the being that it loves so much that food would grow in such a way that no other food in the world would grow just for me for needs that no scientist could ever put in a periodic table everything in the codes because we don't need to it's, we, we made it so that like, we have to somehow spell the Encyclopedia Britannica out of billions of stars in order to be healthy in the world. We don't. It already functions just fine. You don't have to think about walking, you just walk. We shouldn't have to think about eating. It shouldn't be that hard. And we shouldn't die from it. We shouldn't die from our food. <laughs> we should live from it. I'm not trying to be funny, but it's a little humorous, right? You have to admit it's a nice way to approach our stupidity with humor. Someone said to me the other day, I noticed you have a cell phone, you have a smartphone or whatever. Smartphone, right? Haha, <laughs> big joke, right? Smartphone. Smart meters. It's the opposite of that. I said, no, it's just a way to demonstrate the sheer scale of my stupidity. It has a utility for a time because I've used it for writing and people need to get a hold of me and, and all that kind of thing. But hopefully it's not a lifelong relationship. I used to smoke cigarettes, big, uh, kind of a big thing to divulge, I guess. I seem like a pretty healthy guy, but I smoked cigarettes for a while. And I was very depressed in my early 20s and had a lot of awful things happen and whatever. Many of us do. And uh, I actually had worked in a place where you could still smoke in the staff room. And so I was pretty much addicted to them before I even smoked my first cigarette. Little did I know, right? Um, and I would say to people, you know what, there are worse things in my life than the cigarette. So the cigarette is actually useful to me. And in some sense, I suppose that's true. I mean, if you're in pain in the hospital, heroin or morphine is good for you 
compared to the alternative. And so I can understand drug use to some degree, right? But don't make it forever, right? I mean, it's not good, let's face it, right? A cigarette is not good by any stretch of the imagination. But in context, you know, if somebody's family is just lost from a tsunami and they've just been diagnosed with a terminal disease, maybe having a Marlboro is not the worst thing that ever happened to them, right? And still not, wouldn't recommend it, but it depends on your state of mind, right? I mean, given a society where, we, where if 10 is the happiness we should live with, we're giving children a 2 and then telling them not to do drugs. That bring them up to a 9, a 10, or 11. At great cost to their brains. That's not The cybernetic algorithm is like a drug, and it, of course, costs huge amounts of brain function to increase brain function, which then extols itself as the best kind of brain function. That's the summation of all the anthropology and literature and art and, uh, and politics and history of our society of the last several thousand years, in a nutshell. Right? Listen to those birds. Yeah, so I wrote a story called A Modern Fable. I'll try to link it in here. I've made I've got such a queue of videos I haven't uploaded yet. It's hard for me to um put everything in the description box, but it's called A Modern Fable. If you go to my blog, cosmicheaven.blogspot.ca and you simply type in in the search bar, usually on the left side in A Modern Fable, um you should find it in relatively short order, and um, I wrote that based upon this view right here. I raised it based upon the clouds of war behind those distant trees, and what they offered me about some of the underlying messages that prey upon human credulity. I talk about World War II, I talk about the dimming of the human mind, and the rabbits all scurrying because they're told some fearsome force is about to wreak its doom upon them. So they pick up pitchforks and guns and everything else, and they just look for someone to tell them to point who, who to fight, who the enemy is. There's such beauty all over the world. I watch videos all the time. I see people in everywhere, different beautiful colored skin, smiles, children playing, just making the most of their environment. People just need a little bit of a leg up. They need some respect for their intelligence. I said to my family, you know, they never wanted to do it. I said, if everyone just took a little more responsibility for themselves, our family would operate so much better. But I don't want to contradict myself because you can't tell the illness of the world how to behave. It eats everything. It eats everything. And you can't control it. You can observe it. Maybe you can make suggestions. I don't know. You can just observe it. There's a sort of neutrality, I suppose, in observation. And by God, you know, seek your space. Health is dependent upon the quality of your air, your food, your environment, and your relationships. Any disease I know anyone has ever had, it's going to come down to all those things. And, of course, many more subcategories. But I see people with their own land who get illnesses. There's people who get their own land and they literally work themselves to death on it because they're still running the cybernetic algorithm that if I want to be happy, I have to work harder. Instead of by relaxing, by seeking that inner peace, that inner fullness, whatever that is to you. And it could take years, and probably it should take years, to get little bits and little bits and little bits and little bits. Then start seeing what God has written for you in the stars and in this nature, and it's easy. Take time to know your land. Take time to look around you. What is God saying about how he planted these trees? How these... Look at what the bees go for. Look at the colors. You know, in order to, to write literature, I had to study literature. I had to read, you know, Keats' Ode to Beauty. That was one of the things that first started me writing at a higher level. About 15 years ago. Right. And you have to read what God wrote inside you and outside you, if you want to start speaking the language of your birth. And by speaking, I mean behavior, I mean what to plant, where to plant, what to conceive of for your life, what ultimately, whatever you decide to do and wherever you're at, is nourishing you over every horizon, just sending its wind and its water, it's clarifying its air, 
It's producing more carbon dioxide as the warm, as the world heats up a bit in order to help us process what oxygen remains to us with billions of cars in the world and industry. It's doing everything it can, right? We're not alone. So if you've got this army of creation working for you, what are you going to do? Wow, what are you going to do? You can do whatever you want. The power that comes to us every day. Don't piss it away. But of course, we haven't been told about it. You know what power I'm talking about. You see it right now. You hear it in my voice. You hear it in your own voice every day when you talk about what you need and what you dislike and what you're disgusted with and what you love and what you 